Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is probably one of the most important, imperative, and profound sermons that God has graced me to serve you so far in our stress management series. Like without this wisdom, it is deleterious, venomous, and dangerous for the soul of man to not be able to identify and you can't discern when something is not God's will. Say it one more time. It is deleterious, dangerous, and venomous for the soul of man when we cannot identify what is God's will versus what is my will versus what is their will versus what is a satanic trap. And many times the church has done us a disservice because we tell you be in the will of God, but we never have taught you how to identify the will of God. And so I want to show us something that Jesus says. We have four foundational texts. I could not compartmentalize or or compact this to just one text. I want to show you this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. If you do not have it, it's okay. It'll be projected for you on the screen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. The disciples were rolling up on Jesus and they said, Lord, like, why do you keep on talking to the people in parables and Jesus says because the secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom has been given to you but not to them now there are two takeaways that we can have from this text he says the secret somebody say secrets this means this is this is something that is hidden This is not a penny that you find on the ground. You might go outside and find a penny, but you're not going to go outside and find a hundred dollar bill on the ground. This is not something you stumble over. This is something that is hidden. The mysteries of the kingdom. The second takeaway from the text is he says, okay, it's given to you, but not to them. So you need to recognize that there is a you and there is a them. I know we don't like this, but we have to break it down. There is a you and there is a them. Right now in the sanctuary, there is a you and there is a them. Who is the you? Disciples. Followers of Jesus. My intercessors. My worshipers. Those who aren't content with casual Christianity. Those who want to go deeper. Those who want to go higher. Those who want to experience the glory of God. Those who want to know him. Those who are intimate with him. Jesus says, if you're like that, this is for you. I have a breaking announcement, church family. This sermon on this afternoon is for hungry people. And if you're not hungry, you're going to get sleepy. But for the rest of us who say Sunday is not enough. Minimal Christianity is not enough. A little Jesus is not enough. This is for you. He says, there is a you. Who is the you? People who follow me. And then there is a them. Who is them? They are people who only want the hand of God, not his heart. The them are the people who come just for the loaves, just for the two fish and five loaves, just for what Jesus can do for you. Them is people who who treat Jesus like a crisis line. That is them. For them is hidden. But for those of us who are desperate, for those of us who are hungry, he says, listen, the secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom has been given to you, but, but not to them. In Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus says, I will give you the keys. Somebody say keys. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Watch this. These keys right now, if I were to give them to my sister, she might be excited. She might be jubilant. She might even be happy. But after a while, she's going to get frustrated. You know why? Because she has the keys, but she doesn't have the knowledge of what it access. 
Y'all hear me? She has the keys to a car. She has the keys to a studio. She has the keys to a house. But eventually she's going to get frustrated because she does not have the knowledge on how to use the key and where to use the key and when to use the key. This is for all of those who post scriptures online. This is for all of those who hashtag scriptures, but you're not seeing the power of the manifestation of the word of God in your life. It's because you have the keys, but you don't have the knowledge. So you're in church 20, 30 years, quoting keys, but never unlocking doors. <laughs> quoting keys, hashtag keys, Proverbs 31 woman, keys, Ephesians 5 man, keys, but never experienced the power of that key. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Then watch this. This is where we see Jesus get a little turned up. We touched on it last week, but I want to show you this one scripture that was rocking me all during sermon prep. Luke chapter 11, verse 52, Jesus says, whoa, somebody say whoa. Whoa, whoa to you experts in the law because you have taken away the, what's that word? Key. My God, you have taken away the key to knowledge. <laughs> now look, you yourselves have not entered and you are hindering others who are trying to enter. He's saying, listen, you have taken the key. Are y'all seeing the marriage between this text? I will give you the secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom. I will give you keys to the kingdom. Woe to you experts of the law. You know what that is? Pastors. Woe to you pastors who aren't giving them the key to the kingdom. Woe to you teachers of the law. They're experts, y'all. These aren't part-time people who read the Bible. These are people who read the Bible for a living. You Pharisees, you Sadducees, you take the key. And I was like, God, how do we take the key? We take the key by entertaining them to death. So when you come to church, you shouting and you doing entertaining you to death. I give you sugar to death. I condemn you to death. I tell you my perspective to death. And the whole time I'm doing that, I'm taking the key. So you've been in church four, five, six, ten years, and you still don't know how to identify the voice of God. Five, six years, and you still can't identify when God is saying, this is me. And when God is saying, my hand's not on that, don't touch it. And the church has done a great job of telling us about the hand of God. It's your season. It's your time. Your breakthrough's on the way. It's your blessing. The church has done a wonderful job telling you about the hand of God, but we have not done a good job with teaching people how to hold his hand. What is that, pastor? That's walking in the will of God. That's being in the will of God. That's conforming my life to the will of God. I know you want his hand, but I believe the prophetic question God is asking us on this afternoon, will you hold it? Will you hold it? I want us to see this, this picture. This picture was taken roughly six years ago of my daughter, and she's upset. <laughs> Y'all see her face? She's upset. She's mad. Now, I want to give you a little context to why baby girl is looking like, I wish you would try me. <laughs> Back then, six years ago, I would watch my daughter and my son. He wasn't born yet. My wife was pregnant with my son. And during the day, I had my daughter. And so we would go in the backyard and we would play and we would have father and daughter time. And then when Tanisha would come home, because she was an elementary music teacher, when she would come home, our doctor told us, as you are entering the third trimester of your pregnancy, you need to walk a little more. So once Tanisha got home, I told baby girl, OK, we're about to go to go on a walk. We're going to go from the backyard to the front yard. Somebody say transition. We're about to go from this level to that level. Somebody say transition. I'm about to take you from one place to the next place. Somebody say transition. 
But there was one requirement that her father had if I'm going to take you to this next place. And she wasn't feeling it. She wasn't liking it. And her face is letting us know that she did not agree with the decision that her father made. I said, if you're going to go with us, you're going to have to hold our hand. Talk, Holy Spirit. You're going to have to hold our hand. She is frowning because she's told, if you want to go here, if you want to go from level to level, if you want to go from glory to glory, if you want to enter into another dimension of peace that you never had before, there was one requirement that is required for where I'm about to take you. You have to hold my hand. You have to hold daddy's hand. You don't want to hold daddy's hand. You have to hold mama's hand. There has to be some spiritual authority in your life that can hold your hand as you're about to access this next realm. This is why I'm so passionate about healing on the inside. If you ever have listened to any sermon series of mine, it almost sounds like biblical therapy. I'm so passionate about getting us to heal on the inside because I recognize trauma robs your ability to dream. Did y'all hear what I just said? Trauma robs your ability to dream. So when I have trauma from the divorce and trauma from childhood and I'm stressed out from what I'm doing, trauma robs your ability to dream. And watch this, some dreams God gave you. Why are you trying to water down your dream? God gave you that. Come here, Joseph. Your dream was not just because of what you ate last night, son. Your dream was me telling you about your destiny. Some dreams God gave you. And when we are broken on the inside, that trauma will cause us to exchange our dream for paranoia. And so when God tells you to do something in faith that requires a risk, your paranoia won't let you. So I said, okay, I need us to heal on the inside because they're going to be requirements as benevolent followers of Jesus that's going to require for us to be healed enough to do it. She viewed the hand, put it back up, Carl. She viewed the hand as limitation. You know why? Because she was so used to her father of the backyard. Y'all miss what I just said. She's so used to what she could do with her father in the backyard. I wonder how many of us God can't promote because you have fallen in love with backyards. That's that's your comfort zone. I don't want to help with the parking lot. I don't want to help with children's church. Intentional, (laughs) y'all. I don't want to do. I have fallen in love with being comfortable. But for me to take you to another realm, it's going to require for you to be uncomfortable. I'm comfortable in this relationship. But here's the thing that we're not seeing. The the expensive thing of the relationship is you have him or her, but you don't have the hand. See that? Thank you for the one golf clap. She viewed the hand as limitation. She began to pull the hand away, say, Daddy, I don't want to go. I don't want to do this. And I'm trying to convince her, I have a plan for you. If you hold our hand, we're going to walk and go to the park. And at the park, Daddy could push you. And Daddy could play with you on the seesaw. And we could have fun at the park. I'm really trying to give you a hope and to give you a future. But I need you to trust that what I have for you is better than the backyard. (laughs) Hope y'all are getting this. And so I'm trying to convince her and I'm trying to persuade her. Some people go to their grave with God saying, would you trust me? Would you trust what I'm going to do? Enough with the backyard. I want to do this. Now you're 40. I want to do this. Now you're 50. I want to do this. Now you're 60. The whole time I'm saying, I want to do it, but will you hold my hand? Will you hold my hand? And here's the thing. Ooh, your neck. Here's the thing. You could always tell When you are dealing with a baby, because they view the hand as preventative versus protective. 
I can always tell when I'm dealing with somebody who needs to grow up when they view the hand as preventative versus protective. The reason I want you to hold our hand is because if a car is coming, I can snatch you back. The reason I want you to hold my hand is because if a dog comes, I can pick you up. I can make sure there are certain things that can reach you. I'm not trying to hold your hand to prevent you. I'm trying to hold your hand to protect you. He says, woe to you, experts of the law, for you take the key of knowledge away. And you know why you take it? Because you haven't entered it yourself. And you're trying to hinder other people who are trying to enter it. This is why they hate on you, sis, when your key works for you. <laughs> it's because I have learned how to use the word. You just talk about the word but devils and demons can quote scriptures too I'm not just trying to quote it I'm trying to apply it now fourth foundational scripture a very popular text in Christendom depending on where you are in your Christian journey you've heard this before Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 he says for I know the plans you have for you. Is that what the text says? For I know the plans you have for you. I know you want the ministry to grow. I know you want to be married by, 38, by 32. I know you want to have children by 26. I know the plans that you have. No, the text says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. I have a plan. But the question is, will you hold my hand? You can't get the plan without the hand. And a lot of us, we want the plan, but we don't want to hold the Y'all preaching. <laughs> I want what you have for me, God. But I also want what I have for me, God. For I know the plans I have for you. For I know the plans I have for you. For I know the plans I have for you. Hmm. Maybe this is why we're so stressed. Because we want God's plan our way. <laughs> that hit, didn't it? <laughs> Maybe this is why we're so stressed. Maybe you're stressed not because you're confused about what decision is right, but rather you're trying to make your decision right. It's not I don't know what's right. I just want to make my decision right. God bless this. I didn't come to you for your direction. I first made the selection. I don't know why I'm rhyming, y'all. I need to drop an album. I'm sorry. I didn't first seek your direction, but God, would you bless my selection? And God's saying, you got it backwards. If you first seek my direction, then I will tell you if that's my selection. Maybe that's why you're so stressed. Can I get somebody to say, maybe that's why? Y'all got to say it high pitch. Say, maybe that's why. Maybe. <laughs> Just maybe that's why you're so stressed. Pastor, I, I just don't hear the voice of God on this. You know, it's going to be hard for you to hear the voice of God, bro, when you already decided what you want him to say. God is not fluent in preference. <laughs> He's not fluent in preference. Maybe that's why we're so stressed. Or could it be we're stressed because we're trying to force what's not our flow? trying to force it to work. This is how narcissists are born. They try to force stuff to work. This is how manipulators are born. They try to force stuff to work. I'm trying to force what's not my flow. I'm trying to force this relationship. I'm trying to force this ministry. I'm trying to force. This is what I've learned. When it's you, it's forced. When it's God, it flows. Can I help somebody? 
When it's God, there's just a flow. And I can't speak for anybody else, but I want to live in the flow. I don't want to live in what's forced. I want to live in what is the flow. And I understand the sticks of pain can fall in the flow, but sticks can't stop streams. I want to live in the flow. I want to live in the flow. And some people won't like you. Some people will talk about you and they'll try to throw rocks of criticism, but rocks can't stop rivers. You go try to throw a rock in a river and see if it stops the flow. I wonder, is there anybody, at least 20 of us, who are saying, God, I want to live in the flow. I want my marriage to live in the flow. I want my ministry to live in the flow. I want my home to live in the flow. Let me give you an acronym for flow. Favorite lanes, owners work. When you are living in your flow, it's your favorite lane. You own it, so you're working it. The reason it's not flowing for you is because you might not be favored in that lane. You might not even own that lane, so your work is not working. But when you operate in the flow, I discovered my favorite lanes. I'm owning it, and I'm working it. I'm staying in the flow. Not your flow, because that's forced, but I'm staying in the flow. People talking about me, though. My friends don't support me. I thought they would support my entrepreneurial pursuit. Can I tell y'all something that I've discovered? Your enemies will believe in you more than your friends. <laughs> Let me give you a Bible so that you can see I'm not just giving you my opinion. You remember when Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, he said, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be buried, and on the third day, I'm going to get up. He was telling that to his friends. The disciples, he called them friend. Now, once Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and he suffers many things, he gets crucified, and he dies. Everybody, all of his friends, went back to their normal lives. Peter went back fishing. Everybody was like, well, it was a good run, bro. But I want you to look at what the enemies of Jesus did. Matthew chapter 27, verse 63, it says, Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. That last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know. How is it the enemies believe that Jesus said he would get up so much so to where they're standing outside of a tomb? You don't stand out of a side of a tomb of a dead man unless you believe he's going to get up up y'all didn't hear what I just said your enemies will believe in you more than your friends for I know the plans that I have for you for I know the plans I have for you maybe we're so stressed because we want God's will our way maybe we're so stressed because we're trying to open doors that's not yours. Maybe you're so stressed because you're trying to get in rooms that aren't yours. Platforms that aren't yours. See, this is the danger of this generation. Because for Labor Day weekend, when I was in middle school, I didn't know what y'all did. <laughs> Had no clue. I was content with my mom's barbecue and her potato salad. I appreciated not knowing what everybody else was doing. But now we live in an era where we are constantly overexposed to everybody's post perception. They post how they want you to perceive their life is. So when you go home and you have your barbecue and your potato salad, you were happy, you valued it, and you appreciated it until you saw your girlfriend got engaged on Labor Day. Until you saw your homies and them went down and jet skied at the beach on Labor Day. Why did they invite me? Until you see that somebody got a new house on Labor Day and they got a new car on Labor Day. So now you are undervaluing your barbecue and potato salad because you're seeing what everybody else is doing. And the struggle for my generation is we keep watching other people's story and abandoning ours. 
God has you right where he wants you, but you are underappreciating this season because of their post, because of their reel, because of their subscribers. It's almost as if not knowing help me elevate my peace. This is prophetic for somebody. Get off social media. It keeps on stealing your peace. You didn't think nothing about a car until you saw they post theirs. Now you're looking at your barbecue like it ain't that good anyway. <laughs> Overexposed. And this is what I've seen. This has also bled over into the area of discovering purpose. And so we'll look online, see somebody else's posts, and say, God, I want you to do in my ministry what you, do, what you did in theirs. I, I want relationship goals. Please let me tell you first. Don't relationship goal anybody. You don't know what is behind that curtain. Am I telling the truth? You don't know what's behind that curtain. I would holler out some names, but it might go viral, and I don't want anybody to take my sermon out of context. But you don't know what is outside, what is behind that curtain. I want a man like someone, so you don't know how that brother is at home with his wife? I want a, I want a wife like a sister so-and-so. You don't know how she talks to her husband. You don't know? Y'all go in the movies, why can't you treat me like that, babe? You see how nice he is? You see, if I was a dude, I would say, he not even like that. He's an actor. <laughs> you want me to act like an actor? Because we're good at acting. <laughs> Somebody just caught that. <laughs> We're real good at acting. Do you want me to act like him? Because that was just a script, baby. I'm trying to force things to flow. And I want God to do this. You see how God did that? You see how God did that? And then I started to study and I said, ooh, but what are you going to do if God decides to give you a 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 assignment? Eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard. Nor has the heart of man even perceived what God is about to do in your life for those who have loved him. So when you only go off of what you see, you actually can limit God for what he's going to do. Because what I'm going to do in your life, eyes haven't seen it. What I'm going to do in your ministry, eyes haven't seen it. What I'm going to do in your life, ears haven't heard it. What I'm going to do in your lifetime, hearts can't conceive it. Maybe we're comparing so much and God might want to give you a eyes haven't seen and a ears haven't heard testimony. You have to get to this place. God, I don't care how you do it. Just do it. Just do it. For I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you. See, if you're going to be a real kingdom ambassador, you have to be okay with creating paths. See, our generation traffics and being trail gazers, but God is trying to raise up some trail blazers. I don't know why I'm rhyming, Ben. I promise it's not my notes. I don't know why. Now, look, look. When you are called to be a trailblazer, stop allowing those who only follow trails to affect your blaze. Because this is something that they haven't seen. And this is something they haven't heard. God is doing a new thing. Maybe that's why we're so stressed. And church family, I believe my mandate, my assignment on this afternoon is I want to assist us, of course, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, I want to assist us to be able to discern when God's hand is on a thing and when God's hand is off a thing. It's going to be critical for your Christian journey for you to be able to identify the yes of God from the no of God to the be still of God. If I can't identify any one of those three, I risk putting myself in a season where I'm experiencing unprofitable pain. Sometimes the yes of God comes with pain. And this is what I've learned. At least 
allow the pain to give me a profit. If it's going to be painful, I want to grow from it. If it's going to be painful, I want to learn from it. But don't allow me to experience pain that was never a part of my flight plans for my destiny. So I, I want to speak around this thought from this subject for just a few moments for part five of our stress management series. Is this the will of God? Is this God's will? I want us to say this confession. Can I get everybody to say this as loud as you can? And everybody online, just put it in the room in all caps. Can I get us to say, Father, Father give, me the discernment give me the discernment and spiritual intelligence, spiritual intelligence. to choose, to choose what, you have chosen. what you have chosen. I'll hold your hand. Hold your hand. One more time. Father, Father give, me give me the discernment and spiritual intelligence, spiritual intelligence. To, choose to choose what you have chosen. I'll hold your hand. Is there anybody in the house that has arrived to that place? I'll hold your hand. I may not like it, but I'll hold your hand. I'll hold your hand. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more fulfilling, holistic, and soul satisfying and liberating to hit the heart of man like being in the will of God. It is when our will and God's will are in sync. Go a little deeper. It's when your free will and God's will color coordinate. See, the choir was up here a few moments ago, and they weren't matching perfectly, but they coordinated. Since you're a human, you won't have it perfect. You won't get it perfect. That's why Jesus came. He was perfect. But to the best of our capability, you should want to color coordinate. You should want to at least look so much alike that we're matching. I want us to get to a place where your free will and God's will for your life match. There are times you're going to miss it. There are times we're going to fall short. There are times we're going to miss the mark. But to the best of the Spirit's empowerment and our obedience, we should at least match. Be in sync. There was this thing I was watching. I never saw it before until I was watching the replay of the Olympics last year. There was something called synchronized swimming. And this thing was really like impressive to me because the swimmer on the left and the swimmer on the right were trying to mirror each other's motions so much so to where the judge would judge them based on how in sync they were. What would happen to the church if we had synchronized ministries? What would happen in our homes if we had synchronized homes? I'm talking about homes that are in sync with what God's will is for the home. I feel this, y'all. I got to get rid of going teach them all, but can I get us to say this? Uh, God, I want your will and my will to be in sync. If it's not, move me. If it's not, push me. If it's not, tune me. I want to be in sync. I feel this, y'all. If you ever go to an orchestra event, the first things the instruments, the instrument players do is tune. <laughs> you and I are instruments that God wants to breathe through. You and I are instruments that God wants to work through. And the more in tune I am to his rhythm and the more tuned you are to his rhythm, we can now have a harmonious church. Amen. Harmonious ministry. No matter how much schooling they got, if they started to blow through those clarinets and that bassoon and that saxophone without tuning, it would sound horrible. Even though they're playing the chords correctly, even though they have a conductor conducting them, even though they're looking at the sheet music or have it memorized, if your instrument is out of tune, we'll never have harmony. And a lot of us are playing off notes in the orchestra of the kingdom because we don't allow God to tune us, to be in sync. Now, here's the thing, church fam. I got to go in teacher mode. 
To be in sync with God's will is always going to require a eulogy of yours. Did y'all hear me? To be in sync with God's will, it is always going to cause a eulogy to your will. Bible, Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The reason his kingdom can't come in a lot of our lives is because our will hasn't gone. Whenever we want to be in sync with the will of God, something in your life will always end. This is interwoven all throughout the fabric of scripture. Elisha had to end his plowing business if he wanted to be in sync with God's plan for his life, follow behind Elijah and get a double portion. Ruth had to end worshiping her gods and following her people. Hers was actually literal. Her, her first husband, Malon, had to actually die. So her will and what she had had to die so that she could be in sync with the will of God for her life. Gideon hiding in a wine press, that had to die so that he could be in sync with actually becoming a mighty warrior. Even Jesus' life had to die and get up from the grave so that we can all be in sync and experience redemption. I'm just naming a few. I can keep going. All throughout the text, we see the ending of something is really the beginning of something. The genesis of the beginning of God's will in your life is when we sacrifice our will on the altar of obedience. Say it one more time. The genesis of the beginning of God's will in our life is when we sacrifice ours on the altar of obedience. And this is why I'm doing this, because I recognize bad doctrine gives you bad directions. <laughs> and bad directions give you wrong routes. And wrong routes make you encounter wrong people and wrong places. And the reason some of us are cool with being outside of God's will is because all of your friends are. You can't be around somebody who's in purpose and not get convicted. Think about it. If you want to lose weight and your friend in shape and y'all go out to eat and you see seeing them eat meal prep and you got a burger, you feel something. <laughs> but if all your friends eating a burger too, it's good in here. You just <laughs> because friends extend their diet. Friends extend their diet. I remember our Woman Behold conference back in 2017, I talked about this. There was this young dude, I really, really liked this dude. It's like one of my favorite movies. His name was Simba. Y'all ever heard of him? Like Simba was singing this song, oh, I just can't wait to be king. No one's saying do this. No one's saying stop that. You remember that, right? He was saying, oh, I can't wait to be king. Wait till it's my moment. But when it was time for him to be king, he didn't have the character of a king. Y'all know why? Because of his friends who went by the name of Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> Who is about to preach for the next four, seconds, four minutes? Now look, Simba was running from his calling. Because the enemy always wants to get you to run. That's a whole other sermon. And so he's laying there left for dead. Timon and Pumbaa roll up on him. And then as they roll up on him, at first, if you know the movie, they were scared. They was like, oh my God, it's a lion. And then they got the idea. They said, hold on, wait, 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 hold up. Maybe we could make him our friend. Because some people befriend you when you don't know who you are. The only reason y'all are friends is because you don't know who you are. You don't have standards. You don't have any biblical intelligence. The only reason y'all click is because you don't know who you are. Timon and Pumbaa type friends. They said, maybe we can make him our friend. And so then 
after he encounters this interaction with Timon and Pumbaa, they then begin to introduce Simba to their diet. So good, y'all. They say, hey, under here, you got bugs. You got, ooh, the little cream field kind. You got all these type of bugs. Now watch this. Simba is supposed to eat warthogs and meerkats. But since he doesn't know who he is, they are reducing him down to eat on their level. I'm supposed to eat stuff like you, but I'm befriending things like you. And then they put a new tongue in his mouth. They said, Akuna Matata. Y'all remember that? It means no worries. For the rest of your days, it's a problem free philosophy. Akuna Matata, right? And so this dude grows up. I want y'all to see this. He grows up. He just grows up. Look, y'all. He is growing up with wrong friends, wrong diets, in wrong places. And he doesn't feel like he's wrong until Nyla comes along. Nyla comes along. It's good, isn't it? She sees Pumbaa, she said, that's a good piece of bacon right there. Because sometimes, brothers ain't gonna like this, sometimes it takes for a queen to remind a man that you really are a king. You got comfortable over here, but sometimes you need a sister to say, ever since you got out of position, our homes are suffering. Ever since you got out of position, my son is suffering. Ever since you got out of position, don't you know Scar is tripping? He actually think he owns Pride Rock. You need to get back in your position and back in your prayer closet and back in worship and back in devotion. Sometimes it takes a sister. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a help meet to remind you, you out of position, bruh. Everything is suffering because you out of position. And if you would go back and fight the battles you're supposed to fight, Scar's too scared to fight anyway. Then his friend Timon and Pumbaa got depressed. <laughs> you know why they got depressed? Timon was sitting there like, I could see what's happening. And they don't have a clue. They'll fall in love and here's the bottom line. A uh, trio's down to two. <laughs> what he's really saying is this boy done figured out who he was. And since he figured out who he was, he probably won't hang with us anymore. <laughs> Sometimes it's because we are getting bad teaching that has caused us to wrong places to encounter Timon and Pumbaa and cause us to get comfortable out of position. Out of position. And I've noticed this is one of the most confusing areas in Christianity, the will of God, the will of God, the will of God. And really, I understand why. It's because if the advantage for the Christ follower is we can hear the voice of our good shepherd, then the military science of hell is going to be to flood your life with voices. Okay, so God has a will, the devil has weeds. You see, he is behind confusion. And this is what Jesus said, the parable of the sower. He sowed seeds, and then while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seeds too. It's because I want you to get confused. God has a will, the devil has weeds. God has a plan, the devil has schemes. God has a destination. The devil has distractions. God sends counter, God sends God sends. The devil sends counterfeits. God has a door. The devil has a trap. He tries to confuse you. And so now we're in this place where I don't know if this is God's will, I don't know if this is me, I don't know if this is God. And I want to help us. There are really four. There are different people who give a lot more, but I, I believe God gave me a way where we could kind of understand. God's will. The first thing, of course, outside of knowing Christ, you're subject to taking on any will. 
surrendering your, your life to Jesus is what's going to help us discover his will. Secondly, it's, it's scripture-shaped thinking that helps us identify the will. How? Because whatever you devote yourself to will always bleed out in your desires. You see? So if I devote myself to pornography, when decisions are in front of me, my devotion is going to bleed out. If I had devotion that morning and somebody comes to me on one and ratchet, and I just was reading, it's one, man, it's one man's glory to overlook an offense. Okay, you try to correct a fool, they're going to drag you down and beat you with the experience. Uh, I'm not going to entertain a fool. Your devotion will bleed out. A kind answer turns away wrath. Whatever you devote yourself to, meditate in the law day and night. This book will not depart from my heart. How do I keep my ways pure? I have hidden the word of God in my heart. I live according to the word. So scripture-based thinking, this is all Genesis to understand the will of God. But there are four wills. I want us to see this. I'm going to try to break them down quickly. Four wills. You have God's sovereign will. There's this chart I want you to see. There it is. You have the sovereign will of God preferred will of God, permissible will of God, and the personal will of God. Okay? I want to try to make this very simple because it's not as hard as people make it. The sovereign will of God, the preferred will of God, permissible will of God, and the personal will of God. Okay? So the sovereign will of God, simply put, God is in control. He's the one running this. A lot of us are stressed because we're trying to take on God weight. Outcome, results, with what happens, that's God's job. And in manifesting your body as weight gain, weight loss, hair falling out, gray hair, it manifests many times because your body is saying, this is a weight too heavy for us. You can't control him. You can't control them. You can't control what happens. You can't control who watches. This is sovereign will of God. He is the one who is in control. Okay? Now, this, this sovereign will of God sometimes is the hidden will of God too. Because you stumble into it and didn't know it. It is the steps of a good man are orchestrated by the Lord. I'm going to give you Bible, then practical. Joseph, brothers, selling him to the Ishmaelites, him being thrown into prison because Potiphar's wife was lying on him because he didn't give her some, and then him having two officials, the cup bearer and the chief baker, him interpreting their dreams, and then Pharaoh later having a dream, calling on Joseph to come and interpret the dream. See, none of this made sense why he was getting sold to the Ishmaelites. So stop trying to understand it while you're in it. You don't get, oh, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, until the manifestation is clear that God has been guiding your steps. It's the sovereign will of God. Sometimes you're in it, and you don't even know that you're in it, but as long as you keep holding his hand, he's guiding your steps. You understand that? Practical with the church. We got this church in 20, uh, 2008. Six months later, Hurricane Ike ripped this roof off, roof off. Now, we all, now my mom and dad were more faithful. Me, I'm like, man, why would God allow this? Y'all ever been there? Why would God allow this? We just got the building. We've been in a hotel. And when you have church in a hotel, people right across from you bang on the drums. I could barely hear the word. We finally got a building. You going to let I come through here and rip the roof off. I was kind of mad at God, if I be honest. But I didn't know that he was going to use the insurance money to pay off the debt. You see? You see? The sovereign will of God is when he's orchestrating your steps. He's controlling the outcome. You're in it and don't even know it. How do you know I'm in it? Because I've surrendered my life to him. And he's Lord of my life. And he's ruling my life. You get nervous when he's not your Lord, though. Because it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's first the sovereign will of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Maybe 
The boat of your peace is sinking because you're driving. Get out of God's seat. Second is the preferred will of God. The preferred will of God. God has a preference for our lives. He really does. Like, he did not prefer the Israelites to die in the wilderness. He didn't. It was supposed to take 11 days from Egypt to Canaan. Not 40 years. Does this make sense? Because they would not allow, the, he, they would not allow God to lord them, they stayed in places longer than they had to. See, some of us are going through storms that God never preferred for you. Going through pain that God never preferred for you. Heartache that God never preferred for you. God has a preferred will. Bible all day. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Has he not shown you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is God's preferred will. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. What is God's preferred will? That we repent. And then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, not from Hennessy, not from weed, not from an orgasm exchange. I want your refreshing to come from me. Okay, this is my preferred will. First Timothy chapter two, verse three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge. There it is again, knowledge of truth. Remember, Jesus said, I will give you secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom. God wants all of us to experience knowing him and being saved. Somebody say that's his will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So God does not will for you to complain. He wills for you to give thanks. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. God, is this relationship your will? Does it help you avoid sexual immorality? Y'all seeing this? I'm showing you. Oh, it's getting quiet. I'm showing you what's my preferred will. I don't prefer somebody to help you sin against me. So stop asking me, is this your will if they traffic in having you sin against me? That hurts my heart. All right. Well, I don't know. I I just don't do people, man. I'm going to just do this on my own. I'm going to just do me. All right. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. (laughs) Plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. It's my will that you get help. That you have people hold you accountable. If we were to read and study the Bible, we will see his will all throughout the text. For somebody, the scripture for you was 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Avoid sexual immorality. Whoever, whoever's in the house or watching online, you've been asking God, telling you right now, my will is for you to avoid that. And if they keep on producing that, that's not my will. All right? Permissible will, this is thing, these are things that God allows He permits. Why? Because you have free will. Free will is God's love for you. So the question somebody asked me when I was at the barber, they said, okay, if if God is a God of love, why would he send me to hell? I don't see how a loving God, it's crazy how pastors don't preach about hell. Like it's in the Bible, Jesus talked about it. Why would he send me to hell? And I said, you have to understand that God is love and he is just. If somebody commits a murder, comes down here and says, oh, I love you, go ahead. That's not just, right? Right? So what he did was he became sin for us. Somebody has to pay for that sin, so he paid for it himself. He paid for it himself. So if God is love and he gives you free will, would he be loving you to make you spend all of eternity with him? You didn't want him while you were alive. You didn't pray to him. You didn't talk to him. You didn't seek his face. You didn't care what he wanted. And you lived the life of saying, God, I don't want you. And all hell is is God saying, okay, I respect your decision. 
It's simple. It's not deep. I'm not preaching hellfire and brimstone. I'm trying to show us if somebody keeps on telling you, I love you, I love you, I love you, you're going to be with me. That's not love anymore. So I'm not going to force you in my presence for all of eternity when you made it crystal clear that you don't want to have nothing to do with me. It is his permissible will. I'll permit it because I love you and I gave you free will. Your free will is to love, but many people use their free will for evil. Okay? Now, his personal will is what is God's personal will for you? There is a personal will that God has for Jerry, and there is a personal will that God has for you, all under the umbrella of giving God glory. But there are certain things that I'm supposed to do in my life, and there are certain things that you're supposed to do in your life, all under the umbrella of God's glory. So I'm going to go through these kind of quick. So all of the personal things, it is what I'm gifted to do, what I'm passionate to do, what I'm paid to do, and what I'm graced to do. Okay? It's what I'm gifted to do, passionate to do, paid to do, graced to do. Some people think if I'm not paid to do it, it must not be God's will. And that's not necessarily true. You're paid to do things to pay your bills, and you can be passionate about something else. So is this God's will? All of your gifts are all for his glory. All of them. Use all of them for God's glory. I could preach. I could speak. I could do poetry. I could rap. And I use all of those for God's glory. Now, the one I'm most graced for, though, is preaching. See, how do you know if you're graced for something? It's easy for you. It's easy. I mean, it is natural. Natural. When I open the Bible, God just floods information to me. Trying to rap is a little harder. Now, don't sleep, though. I can flow. <laughs> J flow. I can flow. That's one of my gifts that I have. Like, Jesus took my place. Heaven's not my home. Your boy is off the hook. You hear the dial tone? My signal's real strong. My volume's on high. I'm on the family plan. I shall lies with my God. Yeah. And Christ is so secure. Hey, Jesus is the cure. Because he can clean you from your wickedness and make you pure. Just have ears to hear and keep the Lord near. You want to change? Well, Jesus is the cashier. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. <laughs> Don't sleep. But that's hard. That took time to do that. <laughs> That's not my primary gift. And I know that because it's not easy for me. Somebody else, Lecrae or KB, it's easy for them. For me, it's a little harder. So how do you identify what is the primary gift? What is the easiest thing for you to do? The easiest. That is the graced ability. Just because you're passionate about it doesn't always mean you're going to get paid for it. My wife was passionate about worship, but was a teacher for 14 years. Being passionate about worship was not paying our bills. It was her being an elementary teacher at an ele at a elementary school. That was paying bills. So don't let people tell you, oh, if you're passionate, you should get paid for it. Maybe or maybe not. What gift should I use? Use all of them under the umbrella for God's glory. Does this make sense? One scripture, I'm not going to have time to go there because I have to break it down. So I'm going to just go these quickly. Next week, I'll share the rest as I'm out of time. If it's God's will, number one, there will be favor. There's favor. If it's God's will, number two, there's fruit. There's undeniable evidence that this is growing. If you say you're called to teach, but nobody's coming to your class. Seriously. You getting online and you going live. I'm going to wait for somebody to come in. I'm going to wait for the people to come in. Amen. Amen. Bro. Can I be honest? I don't want to lie to you. Sometimes the fruitlessness is showing you this is not my will. There's fruit. Number three, it complements. What is that? It complements God's will. It complements God's word. All of those scriptures we were reading, 1 Thessalonians 4, it complements God's word. If it contradicts God's word, it's not his will. Number four, I already explained it, you're graced for it. This means it's easy for you. 
Now, how do you know if it's not God's will? And I have to end with these and we'll pick up next week. It's not God's will if it's been blocked. This is closed door after closed door after closed door. Number two, it's not God's will if there's no favor. No favor at all. You trying, there's just no favor. Ruth knew this. I want to go glean in whom sight I may find favor. The favor factor shows us where God's will is or where it's not. Number three, it's fruitless. It's fruitless. You passionate, doing whatever you're doing for years and no fruit from it, it's possibly not God's will for your life. Next, it contradicts, meaning it clashes with the will of God. I just believe, pastor, this is my husband, but there is no godliness in your relationship. It's not God's will. Lastly, it's a strain. It's a strain. You have to force yourself to do this. Now, I'm not talking about the will of God disciplines. I'm talking about it's a strain for you to try to do something because you're trying to do it because you saw them do it. You see? Because what's for you, God has graced you for. He's giving you favor with it, and there's going to be fruit. Does this make sense? So I really want us to reflect on this, and next week I'll break down the more because it was a scripture that I wanted to show us, but it was a lot. Was this good for us? Yeah.